on behalf of the Stanton Distinguished Leader Series. There's a lot of excitement in the room. Without further ado, our special guest today, on behalf of the McDonough School of Business, please join me in welcoming. We are excited to welcome you. I would like to welcome you. Hello, I'm Dan Stanton, and I want to welcome you to the podcast edition of the Stanton Distinguished Leader Series presented by Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. For almost a decade, the Distinguished Leader Series has invited renowned leaders to share their unique experiences with Georgetown students and alumni. And it's our hope that this podcast edition allows a new audience to benefit from these discussions about leadership in an ever-changing world. My wife Mary and I funded this series with the hope of inspiring tomorrow's leaders at Georgetown University and beyond. Please enjoy. Hello, I'm Stephanie Martineau, Director of Events at Georgetown's McDonough School of Business. This episode features a conversation with financier and philanthropist David Rubenstein, moderated by Dean and William R. Berkeley Chair Paul Almeida and Professor Pietro Rivoli. Rubenstein is the co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group, a private equity firm. Please listen as they discuss topics ranging from changes in private equity to career advice to reflections on Rubenstein's life and upbringing. Thank you, obviously, to Mr. David Rubenstein for being here uh, at Georgetown at the McDonough School of Business and sharing, I'm sure, some deep insights with us. Now, Pietro and I were thinking, we've done some hard jobs, but this is probably the hardest one of them all because we are interviewing the ultimate interviewer. And we were going to ask the first question, was, did Duke really deserve to beat U UCF? Uh, but we thought the answer is obvious. And we were also going to ask you whether you're really a TV star who also does private equity, or you're a private equity guy who does, is a TV star. Well, the answer to the question is this. Uh, it is surprising how I've spent 30 years of my life, 32 years in private equity, and for that, I, I, you know, therefore, it's a large part of my life. But today, when I go around the world, nobody actually seems to know about that. They just say they like this interview or they watch this interview. And I'm amazed because Bloomberg TV is nice, but it's not exactly 60 Minutes. <laughs> so I can't imagine that there are any people watching it. So I, I, now I realize people watch it on the computers and so forth. And it is surprising how many people come up to me and they, they say, what do you do when you're not doing interviewing? And they don't know about private equity. But I, I enjoy it. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it came about through happenstance. Like many great things that happen to you in life, it's, it's, it was unanticipated. It wasn't something I planned, and it happened by uh, serendipity, really. Good. Uh, I assure you, us students here know all about Carlisle. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you've interviewed some of the greatest people around, uh, very famous people, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Who is the most interesting, and why? Well, each person um, is a little different, and I should say my technique of doing it is one that it, it, people kind of comment on it. I, to me, it doesn't seem that unusual, but what I try to do is, I, um, and don't feel self-conscious when I say this, um, <laughs> uh, my technique is to uh, prepare, which you obviously have done as well, uh, a great deal, but reading uh, a lot about it, but typically the people I'm interviewing I know quite well, and the title peer-to-peer -peer, implies that I'm not you know, somebody that is begging for an interview of somebody I've never met before. I know these people pretty well, so it makes it more of a casual conversation. People, I'm surprised, comment to me on a couple things. One is um, that my tie is never straight. They always think it's askew. I don't know why. That's a big thing to them. Secondly, that I don't use notes. And let me explain why I don't use notes. Um, you can have notes. It's okay. But, um, <laughs> we do. Yeah. Right. I was just going to sit my, on my notes. My theory is this. Uh, what I do is, when I'm preparing, um, I try to make the person I'm going to interview, who I know pretty well, calm. I say, look, I'm not a 60 Minutes interviewer. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put you on this spot. So I'm going to make you feel comfortable. I'm going to give you the questions in advance. Now, when you give people the questions in advance, um, they calm down because they can see there's no trick questions. Now, I don't necessarily ask those questions, but they're calm because they think <laughs> I'm going to ask those. And then um, what I try to do is open with a couple Line, uh, lines that will get some uh, laugh because it, it will um, kind of uh, take the tension out of the room. 
and then take people through the trajectory of their life, but always try to intersperse some humor, because I, people seem to like that. And I try to get people to say what made them tick, what actually uh, made them uh, what they are. And people do like to talk about how they usually came from very modest circumstances, and it, it generally works um, okay, and I think the humor probably works pretty well, generally. So it's, it evolved in a, in by happenstance. What actually happened was this. Um, I'm not a litigator. A lawyer who's a litigator might be good at asking questions. I wasn't that. Um, I, at Carlisle, we used to have investor conferences. And the investor conferences, I would pay a former president of the United States $200,000, $300,000 to show up, and they would show up and make a speech that was relatively boring. And so people were you know, watching their, their watches and saying, when's this speech going to be over, and how much do they pay for this guy to speak? You um, should invite deans for that. Right, we should. Uh, it'd be a lot cheaper, probably, right? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so eventually I figured out maybe if I could interview them and intersperse some humor and break the tension a little bit. And see, when these ex-presidents, ex-secretaries of states are reading speeches, they're just reading something somebody else wrote typically and it's boring. So I, uh, they said to me, wait a second, you want to interview me and it's the same fee, right? Yes. You don't have to prepare? Right. So they said, okay. So I started doing it and I made people like Ben Bernanke look funny and, you know, I, I made it interesting and so I kind of did that, and then what happened was Vernon Jordan called me up. Vernon Jordan is a very prominent um, businessman, lawyer in Washington and New York, and he said he wanted to see me. Now, Vernon is a very impressive person, and when he wants to see you, you certainly show up. I went to his office. He said, I want you to become the president of the Economic Club of Washington, replacing me. I said, Vernon, I've lived here for 40 years. I never even heard of the club. What is it? <laughs> he said, it's a club of 100 business people get together once a quarter. You just get a business person to come in, make a speech, let them give the speech, questions come up from the members, you read it, the cards from the questions, and, and that's it. I said, okay, I'll do that. Well, I, the same phenomenon repeated itself. The business people were very boring speakers, and that, frankly, the questions that came up from the members were worse. They were just terrible. So I would, <laughs> I would pretend I was reading a question from the audience, but I was making it up as I was going along, and I was making up funny questions to, to have some tension in, out of the room, and people liked it. So after doing this for about 10 years or so, the, uh, somebody at Bloomberg saw it and said, why don't you do a TV show? And uh, I said, okay, and I said, what do you want to call it? And they said, we'll call it the David Rubenstein Show. And I said, look, a long Jewish ethnic name is not gonna work on a TV show. And they said, well, this is Bloomberg. We don't, we don't agree with you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's how it happened. And it turns out, uh, you know, it's, it's been enjoyable. I'd say of uh, the people I've interviewed, uh, Bill Gates is a, is a very impressive uh, processor of information. He, he may not be able to pick up the jokes sometimes because <laughs> if you ask him a joke, a, a, a humorous question, but there's nobody, there's no audience there, he won't pick up that it's a humorous question. But other people yeah. sometimes will. So, um, you know, I, Jeff Bezos, we inter I interviewed him about a couple months ago, and it was we had 2,000 people there. Sometimes I have live audiences, sometimes not. Oprah Winfrey was spectacular. Um, you know, Bill Gates, uh, I, I really enjoyed him. I've interviewed him before. And, the question that got the most laughter then, and usually when I interview him, is this. Bill, um, tell me this. Why, when I, have, when I want to turn my computer on, do I need three fingers? Control, Alt, Delete. Yeah. What, what's that about? Why did I have to do that? And he said, well, he started explaining it. And he said, well, we didn't want the computer to turn on accidentally, and you could brush up against it. So you had to make it clear that you really wanted to turn it on. But he said, you know, now that we think about it, it's a mistake. We shouldn't have done it that way. And I said, Bill, for 25 years, you had a chance to correct this. Why have you not corrected it? But he, uh, he realized it was probably you know, the wrong way to turn a computer on. Um, <laughs> I think Jeff Bezos has a very good sense of humor. I'd say, Oprah Winfrey, as I said to her, you have a really good future in television if you want one. Um, <laughs> George Bush and Bill Clinton, I did them together. And they, they have a pretty good uh, yeah. Alphonse Gaston routine that they work out together. So I've enjoyed them all. And I, I, really haven't had uh, problems with, uh, with any of them. They generally play along with the kind of humor that I'd like to impose, so. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but so does, it doesn't pay, I should say. There's no carried interest in interviewing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> if there was a carried interest in interviewing, I would spend more time doing it. <laughs> so you've done all these incredible interviews, right. but you've also been interviewed uh, many, many times. Can you talk a little bit about your most difficult interview or your most difficult interview question that anyone ever asked you? Well, people ask questions that are, um, you know, about what, you know, as a generally, I am not the kind of person who um, likes to brag 
about how great I am, uh, unlike some business people you might know or political people. <laughs> and if you hang out in Washington long enough, you learn how to brag a lot. And I, I feel uncomfortable when, when I'm trying to talk about, well, I did this, I did that, because it sounds like you're bragging too much. Mm -hmm. And so I used to hang out with George Herbert Walker Bush. He was part of our firm for a number of years after he left the presidency. And his mother always told him not to brag and not to say the word I and just we. And I kind of maybe got in that habit. So I, I feel a little uncomfortable when people ask me to say, why did you do this or why did you do that? And it's a nice thing. And it's a little, somewhat a little embarrassing um, to kind of hear people say, you know, all these things I did. Now, uh, my mother used to believe all these things. So um, when my mother was alive, um, she passed away about two years ago, uh, when people would introduce me, she would sometimes sit there and she would actually say, yes, that's right, that's right. But she would be the only person saying that. Everybody else would say, well, he's really not that good. Um, but, but I, my mother, you know, I, what could be the greatest, the greatest magnetic force in life is probably the force between a mother and a son, uh, particularly if they're Jewish, I think. But, and so they, they um, you know, my mother was very proud of what I was doing. And I think some of the things I did was trying to maybe to make her happy as opposed to, you know, anything else. Well, I guess speaking of your mother and your upbringing, you came from not far from here, um, from Baltimore, a middle class upbringing uh, with your parents. What kind of uh, lessons do you yes. bring from your upbringing and from your parents? Um, those who may not realize this, but uh, I, I'm from Baltimore. And Baltimore was the most rigidly segregated city in the United States by religion when I was growing up. Um, the United States Supreme Court in Shelley v. Kramer in 1948 outlawed what's called a covenant, a restrictive mortgage, restrictive covenant, which meant you can't say you cannot sell this home to somebody who's, who's black or Jewish. That was very common in the United States to have covenants like that if you had a mortgage so you couldn't sell your home to somebody who was black or Jewish. Uh, outlawed by the Supreme Court, but Baltimore never quite got the word. So even when I was growing up in the 50s, um, there were certain parts of Baltimore where if you were black you couldn't live and if you were Jewish you couldn't live. And so I grew up in a, in a Jewish ghetto uh, in Baltimore, the only place where the Jews could live together, and it was very modest. My father's last name is obviously Rubenstein, and if you have a name like Rubenstein, you'd say, well, this person's father might be a lawyer or a doctor, some professional, but I like to remind people there are plenty of blue-collar Jews, and my father dropped out of high school to go into World War II, came back, he met my mother shortly thereafter they got married, and he never went back to school, he never graduated from high school, nor did my mother, and so they were not highly paid uh, professionals. My father worked in the post office, he never made probably more than seven or eight thousand dollars a year and that was their only child and grew up in a very modest house and um, it was a row house and Baltimore is famous, famous for row houses and so when I was growing up each of the houses that in this row was about 800 square feet so it's very small and um, uh, when I my son was 10 years old I wanted to say well, you know I didn't have a house this big that we're living in when I was growing up so let me show you my neighborhood I'm sure some parents like to take back their kids and show them how they grew up in poverty or something like that. So I went back and I said to my son, look, see this house? This is the house I grew up in. He said, Dad, that's not so small. It has 10 doors to it. I said, no, no, that's 10 houses together. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I would say this to be very serious. Um, my children have obviously grown up in a wealthy family. I've tried to shield them from some of the wealth and you know, not sprinkle staggering sums on them. And you know, they've all done pretty well in, in education, they're pretty hard working, but it's much harder to raise a child when you have wealth than when you don't have wealth, and it's much harder to be a child of wealthy families than, than not wealthy. My parents gave me what Warren Buffett has said in the interview I gave him, that the greatest thing you can get from your parents is unconditional love. And my parents gave me that because I was their only child and they were, took pride in it, and it, it's a great advantage because when you're growing up knowing you don't have a lot of wealth to fall back on, Everything you do, you have to accomplish it by yourself. And so it gives you much greater self-confidence. I doubt that my children probably have the same self-confidence that I have because they kind of know that if they, don't, they stumble a bit, they're not gonna be on the street. So it's uh, the great advantage of my upbringing was I had to do it on my own. And I, um, I would say final point about this, uh, some of you may be in the category that I'll describe and some of you may not. I describe life in, in kind of one thirds. The first third is when you're, getting, you're growing up, you're getting educated. Next is when you're in the beginning of your career and you're making the movement to make your career successful or not successful. And the latter part of your life is you're often spending time you know, in philanthropy or, or retiring or, or with grandchildren and so forth. And um, I did not win the first third of life. I was not a Rhodes Scholar, a president of the Harvard Law Review, a White House Fellow, all the things that you would say uh, some people have. And sometimes I've seen people with these incredible accomplishments President of the Harvard Crimson, Rhodes Scholar, 
PhD from Berkeley in economics, Yale Law School degree, editor-in-chief, Supreme Court clerk. Those are the people that have won the first third of life. But the problem is, the trick in really having a successful life is winning the second and third third. And sometimes you see people have won the first third and then they coast the rest of their life. They don't really do much. The people that get further along in life and really change the world often are people that win the second or third third. So I had an advantage in not having won the first third in terms of being spectacularly successful athletically or gifted academically, I did okay but not great and therefore I felt I had to keep driving. If I had been so successful in the first third, I might have just coasted and today um, nobody would be coming to listen to me talk. So I, I feel blessed that my parents gave me the support that they gave me, um, that I didn't have money growing up, I had to do it on my own, and that in the end I wasn't so successful that I felt I could coast the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your early years in government and then right. how you decided to make the transition right. to okay. the private sector? When, when I was in the sixth grade, um, there was a man who gave a speech on January 20th, 1961. His name was John F. Kennedy. And some of you, or maybe my age or younger, may have heard about it. It was the greatest inaugural address of the 20th century and had the famous line, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. My sixth grade teacher decided, recognized right away, that that was poetry in prose form. It was only 14 minutes, brilliantly written really by Ted Sorensen, the greatest presidential speechwriter of all time in my view. And we went over that line for line, word for word, and tried to make, understand why it was such a successful speech. And interestingly, the word I is never used in that speech. No piece of legislation is ever referred to in that speech. Um, it, was, it was really a lyrical kind of um, address, not unlike the kinds that Lincoln had given. And um, I just said, well, geez, I'd like to do something in public life myself, do something to give back to the country. So I resolved that I wanted to not make a lot of money. Uh, money was not on my horizon because when I was growing up, there were no hedge funds, tech startups, private equity firms. These things that have made uh, a lot of people wealthy didn't exist. If you wanted to go into business in those days, you joined Procter & Gamble or maybe J.P. Morgan uh, or your family business. You just didn't, and you didn't aspire to make the kind of money that people do today because it just wasn't re realistic. So I had no aspirations in that regard. I thought I would try to be a lawyer so I could go in government, change, you know, help the country a bit. So I got into government by, after I practiced law for a few years, I practiced with, under Ted Sorensen. He was one of my uh, mentors at the large firm that I was at in New York, and he recognized that I wasn't a great lawyer and wanted to get me out of the firm. He helped me get a job elsewhere. I, you know, my clients said, you know, you're sure this is what you really want to do? And I got the hint that I wasn't a great lawyer, which was good because if I had been a great lawyer, I'd still be practicing law. So I, I, um, I was Peter Principal as a lawyer. I got, he got me a job with a man who he said would be the next president of the United States and, and uh, a very talented man who was running for president of the United States at that time in 1976. His name was Birch Bayh. passed away last week at, uh, in his 90s. Um, he was running for president. I thought he deserved to be president. He'd been author of three constitutional amendments. Um, he, he was a talented uh, uh, leader in, in the Senate, but his campaign didn't go very far. So I, had been, I was given the job of being his chief counsel. And as, after 90 days of joining his operation, he dropped out of the presidential campaign. So I kind of said, geez, my act, I wasn't a great lawyer, and my political acumen wasn't so good. I, I picked a guy to run for president. He didn't get very far. So some of you will have this experience in life as well where you think your career is about ended. So my, I thought my career was over. I wasn't going to be working in the White House. I didn't really have a job of any consequence, and I wasn't going back to practice law. And I got a call out of the blue, as some of you might, uh, at some point from somebody I didn't know, who said, would you like to interview for somebody else's candidacy who's running for president? I said, well, who is it? And he said, Jimmy Carter. I said, well, isn't that the peanut farmer from Georgia? And I said, yes. He said, yes. I said, he's never going to be president of the United States. <laughs> um, but I had nothing else to do, so I got the interview, I got the job. I went down and I joined Carter's campaign in 1976, and the day I joined, he was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford, and when I was finished, Carter won by one point. <laughs> so Carter often said, like, what did you do to help me get this job? Because I was doing pretty well before you carpetbaggers showed up from the North. But uh, as we have observed recently, and in many times, presidential uh, staff jobs are not necessarily filled on merit, they tend to be filled on who worked in the campaign. So at 27 years old, I was the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States, um, a job I wasn't qualified for, but I didn't think Carter was qualified either. He'd been governor of Georgia for four years. He didn't know anything about Washington. I didn't know much either. Um, one of my jobs was to fight inflation. I got it to 19%, which nobody's done since. Um, but any of you have this experience, and there's a young lady that I worked from the Obama White House, uh, and there she is. And uh, she was there for eight years, and. Uh, you know, she knows what I'm talking about. When you work in the White House, um, people tell you how great you are. 
because there's no point in saying you're unqualified for this job. Uh, they want something from you. They want a lunch. They want a rec uh, they want something at the, at the White House mess. They want a presidential appointment. They want something. And so people don't come to White House staff people and say, you know, you're not qualified for this job. So nobody came to me and said, you're, un you're not qualified. They'd say how great I was, and I, I believed it. So eventually, um, you know, I said, well, what am I going to do next? I didn't know, but they came to me and said, whenever you want a job, call me up. Lawyers, lobbyists, business people. And I said, look, I'm going to stay in the second term of Carter. I'll be the senior domestic advisor at the same age that Ted Sorensen was the senior advisor to uh, John Kennedy. And they said, okay, but if you ever want a job, call me. Well, uh, when you get 19% inflation, you're running for re-election in a uh, recession, you're gonna lose. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't think we would lose even though we had the inflation problem and everything because I thought we were rolling, running against an old, old man who was so old he could barely get out of bed in the morning because I was then 31, he was 69, Ronald Reagan. And I said, geez, dear God, please let us run against Ronald, run, run against Ronald Reagan because he's practically ready for a nursing home at 69. I'm now 69. So it doesn't seem as bad as, uh, but I thought we would win, we lost. So the next day after we lost, I called all these people, told me how brilliant I was, how great I was, and they wanted to hire me, and none of them ever called me back. So some of you will unfortunately have this experience where one day you're at the top of the world, you think you are, and the next day the bottom falls out and you're unemployed. So I thought, okay, I've got the transition period of time, I'll, somebody will want to hire me, but nobody wanted to hire me. And so January 20th comes along, Reagan's inaugurated, I'm unemployed, and then I figured eventually some law firm would realize how talented I was, um, but January, February, March, April, May, June, none of the law firms thought I was that great, so I had no job. And my mother kept saying, well, David, what are you doing now? I said, well, I have so many offers, I don't know which one to take. <laughs> so, so eventually some law firm felt sorry for me, and I, I, uh, I, I got a job. But, but my government experience was fun. I highly recommend going to government at a young age or an old age, young when you don't have responsibilities as much, older when your responsibilities might be a little behind you. It's a great way to serve your country, but clearly today you can serve your country in many ways uh, in the nonprofit sector or through NGOs. You don't have to go into government, but in those days I thought you could go into government best to serve your country. I did it and I enjoyed it, but uh, I've, nobody has invited me back into government since I left because when you get inflation at 19%, nobody wants you back. <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about Carlisle, and uh, okay. what sectors do you invest in? Which are the uh, firms you own? Okay. What do you avoid? Well, how I, I guess the real issue for me, I'll get to your question, is how, do you, how did I start it? Why did I start it? Um, Carlisle, uh, in, when I, in 1980s, uh, the buyout world kind of was getting off the ground, and buyouts for the young people here may not remember this, but basically it was a novel concept. They originally called bootstrap deals. You're bootstrapping yourself and putting a lot of leverage. Then they were called leverage buyouts, then management buyouts, now private equity. The essence of it was you're buying a company on the cash flow as opposed to the value of the underlying assets that would be valued at a certain uh, number at, the, let's say, a company went bankrupt. You might say it, traditionally it's worth a million dollars, it's bankrupt, that's what the value of the assets are. But on a cash flow basis, you would say maybe it's really worth two million or three million. So people would buy these companies with using leverage, selling, buying them from people who thought maybe they're worth a million in this example, but they're really worth two million on a cash flow basis, and maybe if you fix them up, they could be worth four or five or six million. The leverage was, was 99% in some cases, sometimes 95%. The famous RJR case in 1989, the largest buyout done at the time, was 95% leverage. Today, they're maybe 40 or 50% uh, leverage. Um, so I, I didn't know anything about that business, but when I was practicing law in Washington, I read two things that changed my life, and some of you probably read things that change your life, and they stick in your brain even though they're not, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't reading War and Peace that changed my, my uh, outlook on life. It wasn't a great piece of literature, but these are the two things that changed my life. I read that a man named Bill Simon, former Secretary of the Treasury, had done something called a leveraged buyout in the early 80s of a company called Gibson Greeting Cards, and he put in essentially one million of his own money, and he made about $80 million on that one million dollars in about two and a half years. And it was written up in the papers, and I said, I don't know what a leverage buyout is, but it sounds better than practicing law. So I went down the street to see Bill Miller, who was Secretary of the Treasury in the Carter years, and said, look, your predecessor did something called a leverage buyout. He made a lot of money. Why don't you do it, and I'll be the legal guy, advisor. Well, maybe because he knew my legal talent wasn't so good, he didn't want to do it. And so I decided I would start the first buyout firm on my own in Washington. Nobody in Washington really thought you could do it here. You had to go to New York. And I recruited three people that actually had some finance experience, obviously more than I had. And I convinced them to come, and I kind of mumbled that we had the money. But when they showed up, I said, well, I meant to say I was going to get the money. I didn't really have it yet. <laughs> and uh, it took me uh, six months to raise $5 million to get it off the ground. 
And, why, and you know, why did I do it in Washington? Well, that's where I was living. And uh, I remember what Everett Dirksen, the former Senate minority leader said, when you're getting kicked out of town, get out in front and pretend you're leading a parade. Now, what does that mean? It means take advantage of the situation you find yourself in. So I found myself in Washington, so I said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do leverage buyouts of companies heavily affected by the federal government. And people in New York won't have that expertise. And so it sounded good to our investors, and so that's how we got it off the ground. And it was uh, like most things, if you take, if you take an entrepreneurial chance, It'll, it, it could work out. The second thing I read that changed my life was this. I read that entrepreneurs start their first company between the age of 28 and 37 on average. And after 37, your chance of doing it goes down fairly dramatically. And the time I read it, I was 37. So I said, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. And I'm gonna do it in Washington because I don't have any contacts in New York that like, make me do it there. So I got lucky. I remind people that 99.9% .9 of companies started don't make it. And this one made it for reasons we can describe later, but it, it took off and, and uh, and we, we kind of changed the private equity world a fair bit. So speaking of private equity, I think most of the students in this room are business students. Right. So maybe you could tell them a little bit about uh, things you think they should understand about a potential career in private equity. Well, I think I tell, like to tell students this. First, um, don't listen to what your parents want you to do. Uh, my mother wanted me to be a dentist, and I tried to talk her out of it. I told her it wasn't really for me, and I, I said I, I get arthritis in my fingers. It just wasn't something I wanted to do. And um, you, you can't live your life only to please your parents. And I even tell that to my own children. Um, so, and though I hope they do what I want them to do, but, but um, I, I think you have to live your own life and find what you, is going to make you happy. Um, as Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence, what is this country about? What is life all about? Well, to some extent, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Thomas Jefferson lived another 50 years after he wrote that, but he never actually defined what happiness is. But happiness, presumably, is something that is, uh, we all kind of know what happiness is, and I think you should pursue happiness, provided it doesn't, your happiness doesn't involve hurting other people. Um, I think that in terms of uh, this, what students should do, you have to figure out what makes you happy. Life is relatively long in this context. If you're doing something your mother wanted you to do, and you don't want to do it, something that you really think is appropriate to do because people expect you to do it, but you don't enjoy it, you'll never get anywhere. People who win Nobel Prizes don't do it by doing something they hate. You have to find something you love, and you have to do it more than nine to five if you want to be successful in any business or any part of life. And so I tell students all the time, experiment. Try several things. I did several things. I practiced law in New York, practiced in Washington, worked in the Capitol Hill, worked in, in the White House. Um, I did many different things, and, and finally I found something that I, I really enjoyed. And you will not find it. It's rare. You might be Bill Gates and drop out of college and start a company that is successful, or Jeff Bezos, but you have to assume the odds are not in your favor of that. So find something that you really enjoy and experiment, because it may take you a while to do it. So for those interested in private equity, private equity is um, a different business than when I started in Carlisle. They were only 200, there were only 250 private equity firms in the world in, in 1987. Today, there are 8,000. So it's much more competition. It's harder to get a fabulously wealthy because there's just much more competition you have to pay higher prices and so forth. Um, I think you should you know, look for things that make you happy and that make you feel you're doing something useful with your life. You, you, know, you don't want, I think, to do something where you think what you're doing is a waste of your life and it's not productive. And I like to remind people of something that happened in the late 1800s when Alfred Nobel was sitting at his breakfast table in Stockholm and he read, Alfred Nobel dies. The merchant of death, inventor of dynamite is gone. Thank God we're rid of him. And he was, of course, reading his, his obituary, but he hadn't died. It was his younger brother who had died and the newspapers got the wrong Nobel. But he saw what his obituary said and he didn't like what people said about him. Well, I tell people, and obviously many of you are younger, you're not focused on your obituary, but what would you want people to, to write about you um, on your deathbed or upon your death? Would you want people to say, well, he or she made a lot of money and they bought a lot of houses, they bought a lot of art, and they had the biggest house in the neighborhood, or that they did something useful to make humanity uh, better, uh, better than it was and make the world a better place? And presumably the latter is what you should want to do. Clearly you can't um, know exactly the best way to do that at the outside of graduating, but you should try to add into your life something that makes you feel you're doing something useful with your life so that when you get to my age, you can look back and say, 
you, you think your children are proud of what you've done or your parents are proud of what you've done, and I think a large part of what you should try to do is, is give back to society. When you, when you graduate from a business school, you in effect have a license to make money. Um, and uh, in our society, an MBA or an undergraduate degree in business are often licenses to make money. But if money is the only thing that motivates you, you probably won't be a happy person. The people that I know who've made a lot of money but haven't given it away or haven't figured out what to do with the money are generally very unhappy people. The happiest people, in my view, are the people that have figured out how to be uh, able to give away the money and, 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 and feel like they're doing something useful. And in many ways, you could say it's selfish because when you give away money and you help other people in some kind of philanthropic way, it doesn't have to be giving money, it can give your time, your energy, your ideas, you you're likely to live longer because you'll be happy. Happy people live longer. Grumpy people don't live as long. And so you can say selfishly, I should give away money, help other people because I'll be happier about myself and, and I'll live longer. You know, David Rockefeller made it to 102. You see a lot of wealthy people who've given away money, be happy about it. And then there is also that my theory that there is a special place in heaven reserved for people that help other people. Now you might be skeptical about that, but I've take, taken on a good authority. I've talked to many religious people and they say it's true. And if, <laughs> and, uh, if, you know, and if, you, you know, if you doubt that I'm true, why would you want to take a chance that I'm wrong? I, you know, so try to do something that is more productive than just making money, and I think you'll be happier. And um, in my case, uh, it's worked out reasonably well for me. That sounds like wonderful advice for all of us, even mm -hmm. those of us who are older. Uh, can we switch gears yes. just a little bit to something you said not okay. too long ago? Uh, you said that the U.S. economy was in reasonably good shape. Right. So what I wanted to ask was, why only reasonably good? Uh, what kind right. of risks do you see? And okay. I, I guess most importantly, how do you think the U.S. economy can be made to work better for all Americans? Okay. Um, first, we have recessions every seven years on average in the United States since World War II. Now we're 10 years into a growth cycle. So, you know, it can't keep going on forever. Herb Stein, who was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors one time under President Nixon said, if something can't keep going on forever, it won't. Eventually, we will go into some type of slower uh, growth period, maybe recession. When, when Carter was running for reelection, his inflation advisor said, I think we're gonna head into a recession in 1980. And he said this publicly, and this was the year of Carter's reelection. And Carter called him into the White House Oval Office says that don't say I'm running into a, we're going to have a recession because I won't get reelected and don't use the R word it scares people and the inflation advisor Fred Kahn said what am I supposed to say I'm an honest person Carter said just don't use the R word again it scares people so from then on Fred Kahn said I think we're heading into a banana <laughs> using a banana as a substitute and um, you know I don't know if we're heading into a banana but we've had a 10 year growth cycle and I, the reason I say it's reasonably good we're growing it, this year we're projected to grow now at 2.1%. President Trump said he wanted us to grow at 4%. Actually, he'd probably be happy, his team would be happy with 3%. 2.1% is what they're projecting. They don't know for certain. Um, I, would, I would say that uh, I have some nervousness about uh, the slowing growth in the emerging markets and particularly China. Um, and in England, uh, Brexit is an unmitigated disaster for Europe. Uh, I, I uh, I'm uh, going to make a speech about that in the near future, but I, at, at the place where uh, Winston Churchill gave a speech, a famous speech, uh, the Iron Curtain speech at, at Fulton College in Westminster, um, in uh, Westminster, Missouri, and I will do that in a few months, and I'm going to talk about what he would have said about um, Brexit, and my view is his view would be, which is my view, is that uh, they should have a second election because right now they're heading down to a path where the British economy is going to crater and may take the European economy down, and uh, they, 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 it's a sad situation, but uh, that's a whole other matter. I think generally the global economy is slowing down a bit. In the United States economy, we have these risks. One, we have $22 trillion of federal indebtedness, $1.3 trillion of annual deficit, and growing. We, are, um, we have Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid that are really not fully funded, and, and they're squeezing out the rest of the budget. Um, we have uh, a situation where we have income inequality getting worse and social mobility getting worse, and that problem is not going to be uh, changed anytime soon. So I, I think you have some real tensions here, and I do worry that uh, the economy could just slow down as a result of some international forces or the recognition by Wall Street eventually that we have too much debt and we just can't sustain it any longer. 
So we talk a lot about how technology is changing industry, right. financial services, consulting, logistics. Right. Is it changing the private equity industry? Is technology going to change your industry? And what does it mean for perhaps careers in that industry? Well, it used to be in my era that you could ignore technology and say, well, I don't know anything about technology. And people would say, OK, he doesn't know anything about technology. So you can't do that anymore because technology is everything. Every private equity deal is a technology deal. If you don't understand technology, you're not going to understand how the industries are changing all around us. So I do think that artificial intelligence, robotics, other kinds of technological changes are going to change dramatically the way we live. I mean, just think about this. Ten years ago, uh, there was no Uber, uh, no um, um, AI to speak of of any consequence. And today, uh, you know, without Uber, how would people get around, right? Or, 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 or the equivalent Lyft or something like that. And to, you know, when I was growing up, there were no cell phones and there's no internet to, at all. And so our lives have changed dramatically as a result of these things and it will in the future change. So I think everybody should understand technology better than probably I do. And I think in the future, the private equity world will change dramatically uh, because of it. There was a firm that was started years ago to do technology buyouts and people laughed. It was called Silver Lake because people said technology changes so much, you can't really do a buyout. You won't, you'll, you'll have out-of-date technology before you can pay off the debt. Well, they, they got the last laugh. It turned out to be a great firm. And now everybody's doing technology buyouts because it's generally thought that that is where the, the wave of the future is. And I, I, I encourage people to really understand technology better than, than I do. Good. So um, I noticed that you were on the board of a couple of business schools in addition to university boards. Right. So what advice do you have for a dean of a business school? I, I, I take right. uh, free advice whenever I can. Um, well, I think uh, being the dean of the business school is the highest calling of mankind. So I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what can you do? What could be better? Um, the trick is to uh, make your graduates think that they got where they're getting because of the great education they got, and they should <laughs> give money back to the business school. Um, right? I, I agree. <laughs> Um, look, in, in, in my way of thinking, um, education is what made me uh, able to get where I, I am. I, um, I was a, uh, my parents didn't really have a lot of money, so we, we didn't buy books, but I could go to the library and take out books, and I, books were a very important part of my life, and reading is an extremely important part of my life, and I try now to read 100 books a year, which is a bit of a challenge, but I'm trying to always improve my brain and my knowledge of things, and I encourage people um, to get as much education as you can, read as much as you can, read books more than anything else, and then in the end, give back. In my case, I got scholarships to go to um, schools, and if, without those scholarships, I wouldn't have been able to get where I, I've gotten, so I, I'm very indebted to the schools that gave me scholarships, and I will give you one example of it. Um, I applied to all the law schools I could apply to. to, um, to you know, I didn't know who would give me a scholarship. I needed a scholarship to go to law school, and one law school gave me a scholarship, and I I'd never really been to that city, and I'd been to the school. I just applied, and, and uh, it was the University of Chicago. And they sent me a letter saying I had a full scholarship. Well, for my parents, that would be wonderful. So I was thrilled, told my parents they were happy, and the school then sent me a letter saying, send in the $50 to reserve your place for your scholarship and your position in the school and when you come in next uh, September. And then the next day, I got a letter saying, send in your $50 for the uh, uh, law school dorm. So I figured, well, geez, I've taken a course in logic. Uh, why would I have to send two $50 checks? I'll send $50 to the law school dorm people. Surely they'll tell the law school I'm coming, because why would I need a law school dorm if I'm not going to be going to the law school? Well, that logic didn't work. And um, <laughs> so I did send the $50, because $50 was a lot of money to me then. And $50, I sent the $50 in to the law school dorm people. When I showed up at the law school, they said, well, you never sent your law school money in. We gave your scholarship to somebody else. <laughs> So I, you know, I was sitting there crying. I said, wait a second, my legal career is over. I don't know what am I going to do. And I don't think they want anybody crying in the, in the admissions office so much. So they finally said, well, quiet, come over here. And all right, we'll give you the scholarship. Um, so, I, <laughs> so I've since given them $40 million in scholarship money to make up for it. So it was a good investment on their part. So I think um, you should, you know, it's sadly, uh, College and graduate education talks a lot of money, and I think when people get scholarships, they should be grateful and try to give back. And uh, well, I, I, I have probably have been on more university boards than anybody in the country. I've served for 12 years on the Hopkins board, 12 years on the Duke board, 
Um, I'm still, I'm now 10 years on the University of Chicago board, and I've recently joined the Harvard board. So I've been on a lot of university boards, and I enjoy it because you get to meet young people, you get to feel like you're being involved with the education of our society, and I also see so many grateful students now who come from modest circumstances and are now having a chance to really uh, benefit from what other people have, have built before them. You know, I've started a program at Duke where I, I provide uh, resources for, for first generation students, which is what I was. And today, in a lot of good colleges, 15 or so percent of the people go are first generation. And they have a real problem because it's not only to get scholarship money, but even if you have the scholarship to go, you may not feel socially acclimated if your friends are going out for pizza parties and doing other kinds of things and you just don't have those resources. So we're trying to do that at, at change it at Duke and other colleges. So I, I just think you can give money to many things when you, you get older, but probably nothing is as rewarding, uh, psychologically at least, as giving money back to the places that enabled you to get where you are in terms of giving you an education. So give plenty of money to your business school. <laughs> <laughs> I think they feel they already do. Yeah. But <laughs> so we talked about the advice you'd give our business school students here. Uh, is there special advice you've given your own children that you think they've found especially valuable? Um, I have three children, and uh, they, my two daughters went to Harvard, and one went to Harvard Business School as well, and the other daughter went to, uh, got her business school degree and a joint program that she was interested in, in university, uh, Indiana University and Purdue, a master's in food science and an MBA, and my son is at this, went to Duke undergraduate and the Stanford Law School and Stanford Business School. So obviously they've, they've received you know, good educations, but lots of people get degrees from very fancy schools. The trick is what you do with them, and um, I've tried to not, I've, tried, I've made a lot of speeches saying to my, everybody around the world, I'm, I, I'm not giving away half my money as the giving pledge requires, I'm giving it all away. And I'm hoping my children will see these speeches so that they will say, <laughs> you know, you're not getting anything, you know, you got an education, I'll give you a nice education, but you got to make it on your own and uh, hope they'll get the message that in the end, they'll be happier if they don't have money for me. I don't know if they agree with that, but that's my view. <laughs> so I, I do think I, I, it, it's, you know, what I, I've told my children that, you know, you know, working hard will probably get you somewhere and figure out how to enjoy life, do what you want that's gonna make you fulfilled and don't worry about what I think is the best thing for you, do what you think is the best thing and we'll see what they turn out to be. Thank you, so now we're ready for the really hard questions from the audience. Mr. Rubenstein, uh, thank you for coming from our school. I'm, uh, my name's Joe Silverman, I'm an evening student here. Um, so in the opening credits of your uh, show, you always talk about what makes people tick, and you've talked to a lot of uh, you know, great CEOs and world leaders. Right. And I was wondering if there's any uh, common trends you've seen among these uh, very successful people uh, that you could take home and uh, uh, relate to us. Well, the things that they have in common are um, they didn't take no for an answer. I mean, the most important career advice I can give to people is perseverance. Perseverance is everything because entrepreneurs are usually told no. So perseverance, but the, the qualities that I think, and the people that I interviewed health and have, these are what I think are the most important qualities for, to succeed professionally. One, reasonable intelligence, but not being a genius. Geniuses are hard to manage and you may go off track. So reasonable intelligence, hard work, perseverance, not taking no for an answer, learning how to persuade people and let me explain what I mean. All of life is really about persuading people to do what you want. Uh, even if you're Einstein and you come up with E equals MC squared, Einstein had to persuade people he was right. You can't accomplish anything just on your own. You have to, you're trying to persuade people in so many different ways to do what you think is right. Your partner, your spouse, your child, your student, persuade them what you think is right, your business associates. How do you persuade people? I try to tell people, learn the skills of persuasion. There are three main ways. One, learn how to communicate orally so you can be an effective uh, speaker and communicate people your thoughts and therefore persuade them. Second, learn how to write, and I don't mean a tweet, but learn how to actually write that in a way that somebody reads something, they will be persuaded. And third and most effective is lead by example. George Washington at Valley Forge, he didn't have to be there. He could have been staying at the Ritz-Carlton down the street, but he stayed with his troops to show them that he was with them. So leading by example is a way you can persuade people. So these are important skills. I also think that the skill of, of uh, the other qualities I recommend highly are some humility, not arrogance, uh, integrity, making certain that you're actually um, being honest and not trying to cut ethical corners, and also trying to give back to society in some ways, as I try to describe. Those are the things that I 
think that the people that I've interviewed really have had, which is a sense that there's something more important in life than making money, perseverance, learning how to do something they think is useful uh, for society. Those are the things that I've, I've seen. Thank you. Question? Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Marzo, a second year uh, MBA student here. And my question is already touched a little bit on tonight. Just uh, you mentioned the growth of technology and private equity. Can you just talk a little bit about what's driving that? and just how you've kind of, how that's impact your strategy with your recent fund, uh, the European, uh, uh, your European fund, technology fund that you guys recently what's, raised. What's, uh, what's, what's dri driving the growth in private equity? In the technology sector over the last decade. In the technology decade. sector, yeah. okay. Well, private equity, which has more or less started, depending on whether you count venture capital as part of it or not, in the mid 60s, late 60s and so forth. And it, what has driven it is the rates of return. Uh, over the last five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, and 30 years, in Europe, United States, Asia, private equity returns have outperformed virtually every other asset class, every one of those five year periods of time. So people who want higher rates of return are generally putting money there. And now it's not considered so risky so that endowments and others are willing to take their fiduciary uh, responsibilities and, and, and feel it's okay to, as a fiduciary to put money in these kind of classes. It's not just wealthy people investing their own money. What's happened in private equity is that technology is, is now changing so much, the industry, because all the companies you invest in are changing dramatically because of technology, and therefore people have, need to understand technology much more than they did before. And if you invest in a company and it's got a chance of being disrupted by some new technology, you've got a problem, so you have to understand the technology very well, and also the, the technologies that it can be applied to the companies you buy so that they can uh, do well. It, it's, it's changed everything we do. Every time I'm an investment committee today, or today, these days, I'm always listening to how the technology has changed this particular industry and how it's likely to change in the future, and you have to bet on where the technology is going to go. So I, I therefore re reiterate what I said earlier. Make sure you understand technology much better than I do, because when you're making investment decisions now, they're going to be driven so much by the existing technologies, how the technologies are going to change. And, I think as long as the rates of return are reasonably good in private equity, it will continue to grow. The rates of return in private equity generally outperform public equity market indices by 300 to 600 basis points on average over these periods of time. So as long as you're somewhere between 300 and 600 basis points over the public market index, private equity will probably continue to grow because those rates of return are still pretty attractive. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Rubenstein. I'm Gabriel. Uh, thank you for, for being here today. A lot has been said recently about the dry powder that exists in the private equity industry, right? So a lot of funds have a lot of money, but it seems like it's harder to find deals. What do you think is going to be done with this money in the future? What do you think is going to be the way out for that? What do I think that it's going to be? For the dry powder that, that okay. currently exists. Right, so let me explain Thank you. What he, for those who don't follow this area. Roughly, there's $4 trillion in private equity around the world, $4 trillion. Roughly, $2.5 trillion is invested in the ground in various deals around the world and roughly 1.5 trillion is in so-called dry powder. Dry powder means it's money available. Uh, for those who don't follow private equity, private equity was unique in the money management world because historically, when you had your money managed by somebody else, you gave that person the money and that person charged you a fee. The way private equity works is you typically invest your money over a five-year period of time and the money is called down over a five-year period of time so you don't actually give people the money right away. And so this 1.5 trillion of dry powder is money that's available to be called down and will theoretically be invested over the next five or six years. The concern people have in the industry is that there's so much money chasing so few deals that in the end, you will either not get the money invested or you will have such high prices paid because the competition is so high that the returns will come down. And so the, when people talk about dry powder, they're worried about whether you will take this money and flood the world with so much capital that you will drive prices up. A good example of that is thought to be SoftBank having a $100 billion fund called the Vision Fund. So they're now out in raise, uh, investing money at prices that are often thought to be 30 or 40 percent above what the market would otherwise be. And so maybe they are driving prices up and fueling a, you know, a bit of a, um, uh, I would say, a bubble, some people might say. Uh, there's a general rule of thumb. I don't think that $1.5 trillion as a general rule of thumb is a, is a big problem because you don't go to jail if you don't invest the money. So you know, if you don't invest it, you know, nothing criminal happens to you. Secondly, since the private equity people have their money invested alongside the, the uh, investors, they're not going to do stupid deals just to get the money invested. There's no great percentage in doing that. And third, the principal change in private equity of the last 10 years is that 10 years ago, people wanted net internal rates of return of 20%, let's say. 
Today, they're happy with 13, 14, or 15 percent. So therefore, you can pay higher prices and you'll get lower returns, but the returns are now more acceptable to the market because without inflation having been a major presence in the world over the last 10 or 15 years, people recognize that returns of 13% when you, public markets are 4 or 5 or 6% is still a very good rate of return. So to answer your question, I don't think the dry powder is too big of a problem. It will get invested probably at higher prices than people would like, but the returns will still be, I think, reasonably good. The principal issue will be that the time this money is getting invested and the time it's exited, there will be a recession probably. And therefore, you have to factor in whether the returns will be hurt that much by the recession factor, but that's a separate issue. Thank you. I, I notice we have a few people waiting, but unfortunately, we have time for only one more question, so please go ahead. Okay. So, hi, Mr. Rubenstein. My name is Ladislao Zici. I'm an undergraduate student. Uh, my question is, um, I saw you do an interview with CNBC where you said that you, had, uh, you saw that uh, no signs of a recession in the United States. Right. Recently, there was an inversion in the yield curve. I was wondering if it was still a good um, leading indicator or you think that central bank intervention. What was a good leading indicator? The inverted yield curve. Okay. For um, recessions, the, the, yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, whether the, um, uh, there's a, the, the curve is inverted is generally considered to be, um, uh, the Fed funds rates um, is generally thought to be a pretty good indicator if it's inversion, which is mean that the long-term rates and the short-term rates are basically coming together. And um, it is a good leading indicator, and the curve is inverted a bit, but the past may ne not necessarily be prologue. Um, so I, I would say I think the economy is slowing down. Um, I, it's not as robust as anybody probably would like, but I, I, I wouldn't say the recession is imminent. I think the principal problem that the president has, or anybody running for re-election has, or the American people have, is that at some point, the tax cut sugar effect will wear off. And at some point, I do think that the economy will just slow down. But I just don't know when that will be. And I think the president and his people will probably, and members of Congress, will try to push it out further um, past the election. And the one way you do that is you um, have lower interest rates and you spend more money. And that can fuel inflation at some point and also produce bubbles. But right now, I don't see a uh, recession or a banana in the immediate horizon. <laughs> But at some point, something will happen because it has happened historically. And uh, you know, Sir John Templeton famously said that the most dangerous words in the investment world are, this time is different. So if you think this time is different, and actually we're, we're, we're going to not repeat history, that is dangerous. So I don't want to say we're, we're not going to have a recession again. At some point, we will. I just don't know exactly when. We have one student who unfortunately listened to your words about perseverance a okay. lot. So we're okay. going to allow one last right. question. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Rubens, a really simple question. Can you give advice on how to build up humor? Have you always been so humorous? <laughs> how to, how to, humor. Humor. Um, <laughs> humor is, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's said by people that analyze it that it's, a, it's kind of, a, you know, a uh, self a, kind of a defense mechanism. And it's, uh, you know, maybe because um, you're, you're not confident that you are as great as somebody else, you kind of use humor as a way to kind of uh, move forward. So I, I always never been confident enough, I guess, of my uh, abilities, so I maybe develop a sense of humor. And I have found over the years that a humor and a sense of humor uh, is important. When I interview people and talk to people, I like to see their sense of humor because it tells me something about them. But I realize that some very talented people don't have a wonderful sense of humor, but some do, and uh, it tells you a lot of, about somebody. And, I also find it's a very engaging way to have a conversation because people generally remember the humor. The risk when you have an interview and you use too much humor is that people will remember the humor and not any of the substance. So I try not to have too much humor because I don't want people to just think that's all, all that life is about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Mr. Rubenstein, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to spend okay. with us here at Georgetown sure. for your insights, for okay. your advice, and for your humor. All right. Uh, well, thank you. That's right. So, thank you all very much, and uh, best of luck to you all. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Stanton Podcast Series. Please explore our growing catalog of speakers and conversations.